Welcome to the Weekly Roundup. Today we discuss an old drug which tackles new tricks. Ivermectin treatment in three Brazilian towns. Then we're going to talk about Chinese Academy of Sciences team's FDA-approved ceftazidine represents potential COVID-19 treatment, followed by University of Buffalo, which prepares melatonin trial targeting mild to moderate COVID-19. And finally, ministry has approved the use of 2-Favapiravir-based preparations for outpatient treatment for the SARS-CoV-2 indication. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and the Weekly Roundup starts now. Site News continues to develop a global network of individuals from all walks of life, participating and sharing their experiences from around the world. They share a common bond, a dedication to health, community, well-being, and research, from randomized controlled trials to real-world observations and case series observations, contributing important observations related to COVID-19. Alan Cannell is one of these individuals. Originally from the UK, but based in the southern part of Brazil for many years, Mr. Canel, an engineer by training who has participated in major projects around the world, shares his research observations as to the use of ivermectin in Brazil. As Trial Site News recently discussed, some municipal health departments in Brazil have approved ivermectin-based regimens targeting COVID-19. This is a similar pattern to observations in some other parts of South America. Ivermectin is not specifically approved for the COVID-19 indication at the national level. Now, in mid-July, the mayor of the port city of Itajai, in the more ethnically European South, local public health agencies started offering prevention kits with ivermectin to the entire population, roughly about 200,000, and roughly 120,000 took up this offer. The mayor, who is a qualified doctor, authorized this treatment through the Municipal Health Service. However, public attorneys and the medical establishment were extremely critical as there was no complete medical trials to justify the expense of this use of ivermectin, which Brazil is a tropical country with plenty of nasty parasites of its own. So ivermectin is approved by Anvisa, the federal drug control agency, and was sold over the counter. Now, other nearby municipalities adhered to this plan, as did the state capital. Parts of the capital's metropolitan area and several industries making this initiative partly statewide along the coast. Now, Anvisa promptly restricted sales and limited its use to parasite control, a move questioned by the city of Natal, capital of the Rio Grande, with a population of about 1 million and which had given instructions to treat initial COVID-19 symptoms with ivermectin in early June, as well as a preventative measure for municipal health staff. Again, this was questioned by the medical establishment with a petition signed by over 200 doctors requesting a change in policy. However, the state regional medical board claimed that the law covering state medical boards allowed this protocol and that states and municipalities had been given the right to determine treatments by a recent Supreme Court decision. On June 30th, the mayor then announced the distribution of a million doses of ivermectin to the population via the municipal health services. Now, at this point, the topic had become politicized with groups pro, such as the Municipal COVID Response Science Committee, and against, like the Federal University of the State Public Action Committee. The municipal body then relaxed lockdown rules and recommended the reopening of schools. In late July, the second largest town in the state also opted to distribute kits with vitamin D and ivermectin to the low-income population. Local drugstores mentioned that there was a run on private stocks of ivermectin, so a large but unknown percentage of the largely mixed race population received one dose by the end of July. Meanwhile, on the left bank of the Amazon River, the COVID-19 Medical Committee of the state of Emepa opted in May to treat patients with a combination of the drug azithromycin and ivermectin, which had been tested on the team's doctor, her relatives, and a group of 40 patients, all with positive results. The committee stressed that this is not a protocol for the entire population, but a preventative mechanism for those who are at risk or who have had contact with a possible carrier. 
The results seemed promising, yet the reaction of the establishment was stunningly negative. As an example, a specialist from the Brazilian Society of Infectology claimed during a video conference hosted by a well-known journalist that personal experiences are a horror show in terms of evidence. There may be other factors such as the intensity of the virus or that it didn't affect vulnerable groups. Now, all Brazilians know that the ethnic background of Amepa is partly black and largely Native American, groups that are known to be vulnerable. Also, the upstream state of the Amazonas was hit extremely hard in April, as was Para State on the right bank of the Amazon, both suffering high death rates and critical lack of intensive care units, thus putting the population of Amepa at high risk. The question of how to interpret the results of these experiences is complicated. Evidence is only considered valid for full orthodox medical trials, meaning double-blind, placebo, phasing, and so on and so forth. And this is perfectly understandable for any new drug or treatment. However, in areas such as traffic safety, it's not possible, for example, to test the use of child seats with an orthodox medical protocol. An engineering approach is used, data is analyzed, tests with dummies are carried out, and legislation is enacted. Follow-up analysis then shows if the predicted benefits took place. These Brazilian experiences are then interesting, test cases from this engineering point of view. The three cities are in different regions with vastly different demographics and ethnicity and similar size tests towns in the same areas can be used as controls. Statewide impacts can also be compared with data from neighboring states. So what then was the impact of ivermectin on the number, severity, and spread of COVID cases? Well, the first table I'm going to show you shows the drop in average deaths for the last seven days as compared to the same indicator 14 days earlier for nine states. The data is for September 14th and the official government site and the National Press Consortium, which gathers all municipal and state data. Thus, the second week of September is compared to the third week in August, as ivermectin was mostly administered during July, and the average period for intensive care is around 19 days or two to three weeks. Now, if this preventative treatment had any impact on mortality rates, this should start to become apparent after about the third week in August. Now, each region has similar levels of COVID-related deaths per 100,000 of the population. Death rates were higher among populations in the North and in Sierra. However, the three states with major cities that adopted an ivermectin protocol show a much greater drop. The second table shows the new confirmed cases per month for the three towns, along with data from similar towns in the same regions that did not adopt the ivermectin protocols. The data is from the consortium, and population estimates for 2020 are from the Brazilian Institute of Geography. Now, the last column here shows that the percentage of cases in August in relation to the averages of June and July. August was different in all three towns with an ivermectin protocol. The numbers for the three test case towns show that new cases in August were only 31% of the average value for June and July, while in the controlled towns, this percentage was 70%. These numbers were strongly suggested that for all three towns, severity was reduced and a much lower level of new cases were confirmed. The data does not indicate if the spread of the virus fell, as more cases may have been asymptomatic and many towns are now gaining what is called herd immunity. Total population size is 1.5 million for both the test and control groups, with a total number of cases of about 32,000. For a transparent survey, this would imply a 95% confidence level in the results. Of course, this is not the case for medical research, but if any measure caused a similar rapid reduction in, say, child traffic accident trauma, it would certainly catch the attention of the scientific community and public opinion. Now, coming, coming in the near future, Alan Cannell will share his experiences as a result in southern Brazil on a forthcoming podcast. You can learn more about why municipal health agencies in Brazil started to make ivermectin available in that country with that episode. Researchers from the Chinese Academy of Sciences uncovered an antibiotic approved for the treatment of pneumonia actually binds to the same receptors that SARS-CoV-2 itself attaches to in human cells. Called ceftazidime, the Chinese researchers suggest this drug could inhibit or even prevent COVID-19. Published recently in the preprint server BioArchive, this work is not peer-reviewed and hence cannot be considered authoritative. Nonetheless, the intriguing findings were derived from an intensive screening of over 3,500 FDA-approved drug targets, as well as small molecules. So let's give you a brief breakdown of this work out of China. 
First things first, where is the study published? Well, as I mentioned, it was published in the non-peer review preprint server BioArchive. Now, where are the researchers from? Well, Chinese Academy of Sciences and other institutions, such as Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry and Cell Biology. What is the underlying premise in this research for how COVID-19 infects humans? Well, due to the spike protein, which apparently evolved into this particular pathogen to be able to attach to the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, locating on the host cells. More specifically, there is part of this protein that in sections or areas known as receptor-binding domains, or RBDs, attach to the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 found on host cells. So why is targeting the repurposing of drugs important? Well, due to the length of time and cost of developing new drugs, a repurposing strategy should be considered. Hence, why these researchers targeted for screening existing approved drugs and small molecules. So how many targets did the researchers screen? Where did they find them? Well, 3,581 total small molecules found through the FDA-approved drug library spectrum collection and target mole natural compound library. And how did the researchers perform the screens? Alpha screen, a high throughput screening approach, was used. How many targets evidence promise? Well, to answer that, we go from the top. First, they narrowed the research down to 75 compounds after just the first wave of screening. These compounds exhibited 45% or more inhibition. The team then refined the screening down to 10 compounds. Then what compounds exhibited the most promise? Well, ceftazidime, as it was recorded, has the greatest inhibition rate at about 81%. So what is ceftazidime? Well, it's sold under the trade name Fortaz and others. This antibiotic is used for treating a number of bacterial infections. More specifically, it's commonly prescribed for joint infections, meningitis, pneumonia, sepsis, and others. It is typically administered via injection into the vein. The drug was patented back in 1978 and became commercialized by 1984. On the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, it's available as a genetic medication. So what else did the Chinese Academy of Science researchers uncover? Well, the team discovered that ceftazidine binds to the coronavirus spike protein's RBD. However, it doesn't bind with the ACE2 extracellular domain. The team discovered that ceftazidine stopped binding of SARS-CoV-2 RBDs to the human alveolar epithelial cells, or a long cell, one that additionally expresses ACE2. The researchers' experiments found that ceftazidime stopped an alternative to the natural coronavirus, with comparable ability to infect from penetrating the cells and expressing the human ACE2. So then what is the recommendation here? Well, the authors recommend the drug be considered for treatment against SARS-CoV-2. The drug is approved and has a known safety profile and is generic and economical. They suggest that changes to chemical makeup of the molecule could be probed for optimization of inhibitory actions. So could the natural sleep aid melatonin serve as a treatment for patients with mild and moderate COVID-19? Apparently, researchers at the University of Buffalo seek to find out, and the University Institutional Review Board granted approval to proceed. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration already granted approval of the investigational new drug application. The idea that melatonin would be considered for a clinical trial caught our attention. A recent study out of Iran summarized existing evidence on melatonin therapy for viral infections with focus on underlying mechanisms of melatonin actions. In another study, a group based out of China and Utah, San Antonio, proposes that melatonin should be included in adjuvant treatment for COVID-19, as it has proven mechanisms to target inflammasomes that trigger cytokine storms and acute respiratory distress syndrome caused by the virus. Now, led by Sanjay Sethi, director of UB's clinical research office and deputy director of the university's clinical and translational institute, UB's randomized double-blind placebo-controlled pilot clinical trial and CTO 4474483 testing melatonin is one of a very few worldwide to look at this common over-the-counter supplement. Enrolling 30 patients, 20 will receive with melatonin and 10 will receive the placebo treatment. Seeking to determine safety, this pilot study will contribute to determine whether more studies should proceed. Now, Dr. Sethi says that current proven treatments for COVID-19 are for patients severe enough to be hospitalized. It would be a major advance to have a treatment that is effective in milder disease. The infrastructure and collaborations fostered by the CTSI over the past few years at UB are why the team that is putting this trial in motion was able to come together so quickly. 
Now, the trial itself will be led by Margarita Dubokovic, distinguished professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology in the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at UB. Now, back on June 1st, trial site news reported that Russian regulators approved a version of favipiravir known as avifavir for hospitalized patients. Now, the Russian healthcare ministry has approved the use of two favipiravir-based preparations for outpatient treatments for the SARS-CoV-2 indication. Originally developed in Japan as a flu medication and approved in the country in 2014, favipiravir-based treatments are approved not only in Russia, but also in India, Bangladesh, China, and other nations. The drug was developed by Japan's Fujifilm Holdings Corp and its subsidiary, Fujifilm Tayoma Chemical Company. And in Russia, a local pharmaceutical company called Camrar Group, in partnership with RDIF, have developed the Russian version known as Avifavir. Now, Trial Site News reported that RDIF owns a 50% stake of Camrar. RDIF, the Russian sovereign wealth fund, has been quite active in not only COVID-19 drug development activities, but also behind the scenes working to promote the Russian life sciences sector. Recently, Russia's TASS shared with the world the update to favipiravir status in that country. Russia has achieved technically two firsts since the onset of the pandemic. In May, the regulators there approved the favipiravir version, making it the world's first approved therapy targeting COVID-19, according to TASS. Of course, months later, Russia also was the first to certify a vaccine, albeit in an unorthodox manner. Now, favipiravir represents a sort of enigma to trial site news as over 200 million of U.S. government dollars poured into clinical trials five years ago for antiviral research. While major nations approved the drug for COVID-19, the press is fairly silent here at home. Why didn't the National Institutes of Health at least revisit the drug for COVID-19? If they did, why didn't they share the rationale for passing with the American public? After all, the public already helped fund clinical trials with public dollars. And we find this strange. And that wraps up our show today. As always, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you spending time with us. And as always, I can't wait to see you again. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this has been the Weekly Roundup.